Today on Dr. Osborne's Zone, we're going to talk about the most powerful form of medicine in the world. And the good news is, it's absolutely free. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. We're doing a deep dive today into the freest and most powerful form of medicine available to each and every one of you. And that medicine is sunshine, the most powerful medicine on earth. Now, we talk about sunshine, we talk about light, and there are different spectrums of the light field, but we go from ultraviolet to infrared. Ultraviolet and infrared are wavelengths that you don't necessarily see. They're beyond the visual spectrum, but they have tremendous amounts of impacts physiologically on our bodies, and we're gonna dive into that today. Now, one of the things that I think it's important to start this conversation off with is the rhetoric that's been going around, it's really not even rhetoric, this is most of mainstream medicine, the, the field of dermatology. The standard of care and the standard of advice is stay out of the sun, lather up in sunscreen, um, to prevent skin cancer. So I want to have this part of the conversation first to give you preface on why that advice is probably not great advice, it's probably actually terrible advice, and why. So let's dive into some of the more recent reviews and, and research papers uh, posing this very same question. So you can see this was published in Dermatoendocrinology and um, public health authorities in the United States are recommending that men, women, and children reduce their exposure to sunlight based on concerns that this exposure will promote skin cancer. On the other hand, data show that increasing numbers of Americans suffer from vitamin D deficiencies and serious health, serious health problems caused by insufficient sun exposure. The body of science concerning the benefits of moderate sun exposure is growing rapidly and is causing a different perception of sun UV as it relates to human health. Melanoma and its relationship to sun exposure and sunburn, I want to point this out and circle it for you, is not adequately addressed in most of the scientific literature. And this is what, again, what are we being told? We're being told that sunshine causes skin cancer, is not adequately addressed in most of the scientific literature. Reports of favorable health outcomes related to adequate serum 25 OHD which is vitamin D concentration or vitamin D supplementation have been inappropriately merged so that benefits of sun exposure other than production of vitamin D are not adequately described. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, the non-vitamin D benefits of sun exposure as well. Again, this review considers the studies that have shown a wide range of health benefits from sun slash UV exposure. These benefits include among others, various types of cancer, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, myopia and macular degeneration, diabetes and multiple sclerosis. And this, I wanna point out, this review was done in 2016. So this is not even new information. So going back you know, to 2016, one of the bigger concerns is the general advice of mainstream medicine, which is to avoid the sun for fear of cancer, but what you're actually doing is for fear of cancer, you're trading all these other potential benefits of sunshine, and you're throwing those out the window for a fear that hasn't been really proven in the medical literature definitively. So let's come to this more recent review. Um, insufficient sun exposure has become a real public health problem. This published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. This article aims to alert the medical community and public health authorities to accumulating evidence on health benefits from sun exposure, which suggests that insufficient sun exposure is a significant public health problem. Significant health problem. How significant is it? Studies in the past decade indicate that insufficient sun exposure may be responsible for 340,000 deaths, and this is just in the United States, and 480,000 deaths in Europe. 
So let's, let's do a little bit of math. That's 820,000 total deaths in the U.S. and Europe alone. And an increased incidence of breast cancer, colorectal cancer, high blood pressure, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, autism, asthma, type 1 diabetes, and myopia. Collectively, this evidence indicates it would be wise for people living outside the tropics to ensure they expose their skin sufficiently to the sun. So again, I know a lot of you have a fear. You, it's been ingrained into you from, uh, from the last many decades of misinformation that has been pushed down our throats, both in mainstream medicine, but also in public health. So let's talk about a few other research studies <clears throat> to drive this point home. This one was a major study on women in Sweden, and here's what they found. 29,518 Swedish women in a prospective 20-year follow-up study of melanoma in southern Sweden. They call it the MISS study. Here was the conclusion. The results of this study provide observational evidence that avoiding sun exposure is a risk factor for all-cause mortality. In other words, a risk factor for dying. Following sun exposure advice that is very restrictive in countries with low solar intensity might in fact be harmful to women's health. Now, I think the takeaway here is, you know, if, if you're maybe living near the equator or on the equator, this advice may not apply to you 100%, but at the end of the day, you need sun exposure. And avoiding sun exposure, especially those of you who live in northern climates where there's less sun availability anyway, there's an increased, potential increased risk or an association increased risk of all-cause mortality. Again, not a fair trade. And then we look at this systematic review and meta-analysis of just being outside, green space exposure on health outcomes. And so in this meta-analysis, results showed increased green space exposure was associated with depressed salivary cortisol. So cortisol is the stress hormone, so basically green space exposure reduces your stress hormone production, but also heart rate, diastolic blood pressure, um, as well your heart rate variability, increased high frequency uh, and low frequency heart rate variability, but also decreased risk of preterm births, type 2 diabetes, all-cause mortality, small size for gestational age births, as well as cardiovascular mortality, and an increased incidence of good self-reported health. Um, so this review, a lot of different conditions found to be benefited as a result of being outside in green spaces. In their conclusion, green space exposure is associated with numerous health benefits and intervention and observational studies. These results are indicative of beneficial influence on green space on a wide range of health outcomes. So again, more evidence and reasons to not hide in your house uh, all the time, right? And then we look at this study published a couple years ago in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And you can see just, just conclusions here. Bright sunlight, but not outdoor temperature, might be associated with increased insulin sensitivity and lower triglyceride levels. Again, this was just simply being exposed to bright sunlight. It didn't matter what the temperature outside was. It didn't have to be, it could be winter, it could be summer. Temperature didn't matter, but the brightness of the sunlight, again, increased insulin sensitivity and lower triglyceride levels. So found that specifically outdoor sunlight showed beneficial associations with insulin resistance. Now, how many how many of you watching this are diabetic? How many of you watching this are overweight? How many of you watching this are pre-diabetic? Sunshine, very, very powerful medicine. Now, as we said before, the standard care of advice has traditionally been avoid the sun. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the sunscreen market, and you know most sunscreen uh, companies, or many of them are actually owned by the same companies that own pharmaceuticals, but you can see this is a $13 billion a year market. That's just sunscreen. We're not talking about the $3.2 trillion medical market to treat sick people. And this is just in the U.S. 
3.2 trillion dollars annually in the U.S. Uh, for medical care to treat chronic illness. And again, what I just showed you is that sunshine exposure is linked to reduced risk of all-cause death, cardiovascular disease, multiple forms of autoimmune disease, insulin resistance, blood sugar regulation. The list goes on and on, and we'll keep talking about it. Now, again, that's mainstream medical advice. It's to avoid the sun and lather up with sunscreen, but very rarely do you hear a doctor talk about nutritional protection against the potential for sunlight damage um, with diet, with micronutrients. And so in this particular review, you see here micronutrients can act as UV absorbers, as antioxidants, or can modulate signaling pathways elicited upon UV exposure. UV-induced erythema, that's sunburn, is a sustainable or rather a suitable parameter to assess photoprotection Dietary protection is provided by carotenoids. Carotenoids are plant-based substances found in things like carrots and other, you know, red, yellow, and orange colored vegetables and fruits. Tocopherols, which are vitamin E family, and ascorbate, which is vitamin C, as well as flavonoids. And flavonoids are the chemical compounds found in numerous types of foods. You get flavonoids in green tea. You can get flavonoids in apples, etc or omega-3 fatty acids contributing to maintenance resistance as part of lifelong protection. In other words, what this review is summarizing is that there are nutrients that you obtain from your food that have UV and photoprotective impacts and effects. And so if your diet is clean and you have a good diet and it's rich and abundant and healthy food, you actually can protect yourself from sunlight um, from potential for sunlight damage from sun burning. Again, the, the key here is that sun burning because you don't need to protect yourself from the sun. You just need to be sensible about your length of exposure. So again, nutrition plays a very critical role. And um, one of the things we see is drugs being dispensed to treat a lot of the illnesses that can be contributed to by a lack of sun sunlight exposure. Many of these drugs cause photosensitivity. And what is photosensitivity? That means it increases the potential risk that your skin will be damaged by the sun. And so if you look at this list, and I took these, this list was published uh, pretty recently in, in a major review paper uh, published in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venerology. And so what, what they found was more than 300 different kinds of medications. What I've done here is I've just summarized some of the more common ones, but I want to just kind of highlight, you know, this research study down here for those of you who, you know, who want to go back and, and look more. So like if you want to see if any of your medicines can cause photosensitivity, again, increasing the risk of you getting a sunburn. Um, you want to know about this because if you're trying to increase your sun exposure and you're on some of these drugs, first, it's smart that you know about that. But second, it's also intelligent that you would talk to your doctor about why you're on these medicines because um, many would argue if these medicines are actually necessary in many cases and that if, if you, let's, let's, let's use some examples. So triamterine, which is a diuretic, furosemide, which is also a diuretic, Enalapril, lisinopril, valsartan, losartan, elmosartan, telmosartan, iversartan, um, carvedial. These are all medications kind of in the classification of the fact that they treat um, blood pressure. So if you've got high blood pressure. Now I just showed you that avoidance of sun and, and not getting adequate sun can actually increase your blood pressure and that being in the sun actually can reduce your diastolic blood pressure. So how many of you have a desk job where you go to work all day long and you're not outside and you're not getting sun exposure and you have high blood pressure and maybe you eat not so great and you're on one of these kinds of medications. Okay, now these medications can increase your risk for photosensitivity. These medications can also cause nutritional deficiency. So you've, if you've followed me for any length of time, you know, you've heard me talk about this, this term drug-induced nutritional deficiency. And so if we look at, at many of these medications, what do they deplete? They deplete B vitamins, some of them deplete vitamin D. Now, now 
keep this in the back of your mind because we're going to talk about how important B vitamins and vitamin D are in terms of being protective for you to be able to be out in the sun. But again, these very drugs that are commonly used to treat common conditions cause nutritional deficits. Those very nutritional deficits can make it easier for you to burn and can create other types of issues where you want to have sun avoidance types of behaviors, but can also contribute to the very diseases that the doctor's trying to treat by using the medication in the first place. We see the same thing here in this list, and that is um, these, a lot of these medications are predominantly prescribed for pain. And, um, and so again, you know, some of these common, very, very common medications, if you're taking them for pain, can not only can they increase your risk of being burnt by sunlight should you be out in the sun, but can cause micronutrient deficiencies like vitamin D and folate and iron deficiency and vitamin C deficiency. And so, again, those deficiencies can lead to the very problems that the drugs are intending to treat. And then we have other classes of meds like antibiotics, ciprofloxacin, and then going down this list here, these are antibiotics. And then we, we go through all of these other meds. There's a bunch of them here that are antidepressants. And then there are several here that are for cholesterol reduction. We've got anti-inflammatory hydrocortisone. We've got, these are um, antihistamines. And it, we even have estrogen and gout medication, allopurinol. Um, we've got, you know, this medication, which is an antacid. So an acid blocker. We've got the diabetic medication, metformin. So, I mean, again, this is a list of, of very, very commonly prescribed drugs that can increase your risk of being burned by the sun should you be out in the sun. So the very, you know, the very diseases that sunlight could help to prevent should you get it, you're, you're going to your doctor, your doctor's saying, avoid the sun, yet take this medication. And so now you're setting yourself up for sun failure because even if you were to try to go in the sun, you run this potential risk of increased levels of photosensitivity. Now I say that just to educate you to say, I still think you should get sun, but you have to be cautious and you have to be careful if you're using certain medications because it can create a problem for you as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Now, okay, so let's, let's move into why you want to get UV, why you want to get sunshine as a general rule of thumb and the, de you know, the details of it. So obviously we know that sunshine helps to make vitamin D. Uh, that is probably the thing that most people are familiar with is that you know, when your skin, especially when UV light hits your skin, there's a type of cholesterol in your skin that produces vitamin D. And of course, vitamin D deficiencies are linked to high blood pressure and autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis and, di and uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, and even in, in cases of celiac disease and thyroid disease, we know that vitamin D deficiency uh, increases the risk for metabolic syndrome. Again, these very diseases that we set out in the beginning and said that if you don't get adequate sunshine, you have an increased risk for the development of these things. And of course, vitamin D is one of the reasons why. It's one of the benefits of being exposed to specifically to UV light. Again, most doctors will tell you that it's the UV light that causes the sun burning, and that's the part of the sunlight that you should really be um, focused on trying to avoid. That's why most sunscreens are basically, they're designed to block out UV um, as opposed to other aspects of sunshine. So again, we want that UV for that vitamin D, but there are a lot of other benefits to UV light beyond the vitamin D production component. And one is that um, UV light is actually used in medicine, interestingly enough, to treat a variety of different skin conditions. We'll talk about that in a minute, but UV light also helps regulate the microbiome on your skin as a disinfectant. 
uh, UV light sti uh, stimulates the production of the pigment melanin in your skin, which helps generate a natural sunscreen for you. So the more sunlight exposure that you get, the more resilient you become to more sunlight exposure. So again, when you're new to sunlight, let's say you're, you've been hiding away in a dark closet for years, you don't wanna just go out and lie out on a beach for five hours without any protection. You wanna start at a low dose and allow this benefit to kick in. So a few minutes each day, you're gonna start producing some of your own natural melanin pigment, and so then your skin is gonna become better and better at protecting you from potential sun burning. But we also now know that UV light helps to generate nitric oxide. Now, one of the interesting things about nitric oxide is it won a Nobel Prize, and one of the reasons why is it's a very, very critical um, chemical that helps to regulate blood pressure. Nitric oxide vasodilates your blood vessels, and so it's also linked, a deficiency of nitric oxide is also linked to hypertension or high blood pressure. We know that UV light, when it hits the skin, helps to release endorphins. And this is why many people over those long winters when they're inside and they get cabin fever or seasonal affective disorder, they're sad, right? And part of that has to do with the endorphins that we can produce when we're exposed to UV light. We also know that UV light can actually reduce skin inflammation. So these are actual bona fide benefits to UV light. I want to talk a little bit more in depth and show you some of the research in this particular area. And so what you, you can see here, the role of vitamin D in primary headache from potential mechanism to treatment. Um, this is an interesting study because they were taking patients that were suffering from migraine headache. And of course, one of the symptoms of migraine headaches is photophobia, which is a, a sensitivity to bright lights here. And so what they found is a higher incidence of allodynia, uh, phonophobia, sound sensitivity, light sensitivity, autonomic manifestations and resistance to medications in migraineurs with vitamin D deficiency compared to those with normal vitamin D levels. Well, how do you get vitamin D? Well, you get vitamin D through the sunshine. So again, if you're a migraine sufferer and you're avoiding the sun, um, we see resistance to medications in those types of individuals as well as increased symptoms in those that have that vitamin D deficiency. So again, we need that UV light to produce that vitamin D. Now we also have beneficial effects of UV radiation other than via vitamin D production. So again, I was telling you there are non-vitamin D benefits to this. Most of the positive effects of solar radiation are mediated via ultraviolet B or UVB induced production of vitamin D in the skin. However, several other pathways exist for the action of ultraviolet radiation on humans as focused on in this review. Skin diseases like psoriasis, vitiligo, atopic dermatitis, localized scleroderma can be treated with solar radiation aka heliotherapy or artificial UV radiation, aka phototherapy. UV exposure can suppress the clinical symptoms of multiple sclerosis independently of vitamin D synthesis. Furthermore, UV generates nitric oxide, as I mentioned a moment ago, which may reduce blood pressure and generally improve cardiovascular health. UVA-induced nitric oxide may also have antimicrobial effects and furthermore act as a neurotransmitter. Finally, UV exposure may improve mood through the release of endorphins. So again, as I was talking about all these different benefits of UV light specifically that were not even linked to the vitamin D component. So these other benefits, these non-vitamin D benefits of UV light exposure. So. A lot of people will say, I'm not gonna get in the sun, I'm just gonna take my vitamin D supplementation and I'm gonna, that will be my sunshine in a bottle. And so again, you're not gonna get all these other benefits that we're talking about here if you avoid sunlight and avoid that sun exposure. Okay, so if we look at this slide here, you can see benefits of UV light exposure. Again, vitamin D production, nitric oxide, enhanced skin barrier functionality, and beta endorphin release for mood regulation. 
we can see that medically speaking, these different diseases are actually treated with UV light. In other words, doctors, you, even though they tell you to avoid it, then they also charge you for them to treat you with it. And again, all you have to do, it's free, you go outside, but psoriasis, depression, vitiligo, atopic dermatitis, fibromyalgia, and scleroderma. Then we have diseases linked to lack of exposure uh, to UV light, and so cancers, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, muscle weakness, autoimmunity, infection, asthma, allergies, bone loss, chronic pain, myopia, cognitive decline, and all-cause mortality. So hopefully what you're taking away so far is that you can't just take vitamin D and call it even. You've got to get sunshine, and one of the reasons why is you need UV light to do so many different things to benefit the health of your body. Now, beyond UV, let's talk a little bit about red light and near-infrared light and there's some of their benefits because this is one of the other aspects to going outside it's the non-uv exposure so if we look at some of the noted benefits and research benefits of getting exposure to red and near infrared light we've got stimulation for hair growth improved skin health or studies that show increased collagen formation in skin it promotes cellular health for many different mechanisms which we'll talk about an improvement in circulation and blood flow reduced recovery time. This is recovery time both in trauma or injury, but also in working out if you're trying to recover better from workouts. We have reduction in inflammation, increases in fertility, and as well, reduction in pain. So there's a lot of benefits to being exposed to that red and near infrared light that the sun provides absolutely free. So let's look at a few research studies on this particular topic. So you can see in this study, optical stimulation of mitochondria reduces blood glucose levels. And this was a study where it actually used red light therapies and showed that it actually had a, um, a blood glucose uh, benefit or a blood um, reduction of blood glucose benefit. So red light therapy at 650 to 800 nanometers stimulates mitochondrial respiration shifting the metabolism, this, photo, photo, this photobiomodulation alters cellular respiration rate, increases membrane potential, ATP production, and sub subsequently reduces reactive oxygen species and inflammatory markers. Now let's, let's stop for just a second there because this is kind of a summary in the introduction of this particular paper. But what they're, what they're basically saying is that exposure to this light, this red light, actually increases your body's ability to make energy through ATP. Now, in order to get to ATP, what, what they've actually shown in, in research studies is there's this process called glycolysis or glycolysis, which is where we're breaking down glucose, the carbohydrate uh, chain molecule glucose. And so in order to break that down, or, or rather ATP is formed when we go through that process of breaking that down, but what science is showing in, in, inside of your mitochondria is that there's a little specialized pump inside of the mitochondria that when exposed to these red lights speeds up the rate at which you actually break down glucose. So it, it enhances or it increases the rate at which you'll break down glucose, therefore speeding up the rate at which you generate ATP, which is also known as energy. And how will that impact a person's health? Well, there's a lot of potential implication here. One would be if you're making energy more effectively and more efficiently, you're clearing glucose out of your system better. So in, again, in this study, we're, that's what they're finding is that it reduces blood glucose levels, but also by reducing blood glucose, you're less apt to store excessive glucose as triglycerides and put them in fat cells. But as you're making more energy, where does that energy, what does that energy do? Well, it goes to the, to the maintenance of the function of the body. You need ATP to heal, to repair. You need ATP to run the systems internally. And so by being exposed to red light, you're actually enhancing your body's ability to generate ATP from glucose. And so the, the later downstream impacts or effects are, are quite profound. So coming back to this, this results in improved sensory and motor function, including aged human color perception. In other words, it improves vision. And there are a number of research studies now that have shown that being, being exposed to red light 
actually can improve vision and can actually in some cases reverse some of the vision loss that is oftentimes blamed on aging. So very important benefit. So again, this result potentially has significant for human health, particularly in diabetes management and weight control. Here we have extended these findings. The original research was done on bees and invertebrates, but you can see here we've extended these findings from invertebrates into humans, demonstrating that a non-pharmaceutical, non-invasive optical intervention, optical being light, can be used to support blood glucose level management. How many of you have ever been to your endocrinologist or your GP and, 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 and instead of being handed metformin, which remember what we said earlier, metformin was one of those medications that increases photosensitivity right here. It's the, the, one of the most commonly prescribed diabetic medications, metformin. But how many of you have ever gone to your GP or your doctor and instead of handing you a prescription for metformin, they gave you a prescription to go outside and get some regular exposure to the red light that costs you absolutely nothing except a little bit of your time. It's free. You just have to get out and do it. Now here's another research study on the benefits of red and near-infrared light treatment. So uh, in this case, this was a vanity study, if you will, but it was on the reduction of fine lines, wrinkles, skin roughness, and intradermal collagen density increase. So in this study, 136 volunteers participated uh, and were, you know, randomized and some were receiving the light therapy and then they had a, a placebo group of those that weren't, but the results at the end of the study were treated subjects experienced significantly improved skin complexion and skin feeling profilometrically assessed skin roughness and ultrasonographically measured collagen density. So they did have some objective parameters. This just was not just a subjective outcome. The blinded clinical evaluation of photographs confirmed significant improvement in the intervention groups compared with the control. Conclusions, broadband polychromatic showed no advantage over the red light only spectrum. However, both novel light sources that have not been previously used for PBM have demonstrated efficacy and safety for skin rejuvenation and intradermal collagen increase when compared with controls. So again, this is specifically they were using red light therapies. They weren't going outside to achieve it, but remember, I'm going to keep coming back to it. You got to go outside. It's free therapy. And then this study, week-long improved color contrast. In other words, this color contrast was visual improvements visual field improvement. So recently repeated 670 nanometer exposures have been used on the aged human retina, which has high energy demands and significant mitochondrial function decline to improve vision. We show here that three, or we, rather we show here that single three minute 670 nanometer exposures at much lower energies than previously used are sufficient to significantly improve for one week cone-mediated color contrast thresholds in aging populations aged 37 to 70 years old. So this is probably not going to work for you to improve your vision if you're 12 or 15, but in the elderly or in the uh, middle age, we're seeing actual improvement in, uh, in vision. So again, these are just some of the research reported benefits of red lights and red light therapies. Okay, I want to talk a little bit now about photophobia because one of the things that I commonly hear from people is I'm sensitive to light, so if I go outside, my eyes can't handle it. And so photophobia, which is what we're referring to, and this is different than what we were talking about earlier. What I was talking about earlier was photosensitivity. So photophobia is bright light bothers Your eyes makes you squint. You have a hard time dealing with it or coping with bright light. Whereas photosensitivity is, again, we talk about those different medications, is when you create a situation where your skin is more prone to ultraviolet-induced erythema or sunburn. So they're not the same thing. So again, go back, you want to go back and rewatch that section on drugs that cause photosensitivity. 
but here we're talking about photophobia, which is there are nutritional deficiencies. I said, keep those nutrients in the back of your mind because it was coming to it, but nutritional deficiencies that can actually cause sensitivity to bright light or photophobia. And um, again, if we go back to the photosensitivity, there are a number of drugs that can cause that. And many of those drugs that can also cause photosensitivity can lead to nutritional deficiencies that cause photophobia. And so some of the primary nutrient deficits that we know can increase photophobia, vitamin B12, vitamin B2, vitamin B3, and vitamin D, probably some of the better research on those as well as iron, uh, but also vitamin A, zinc, copper, vitamin C, and vitamin E for their antioxidant capacity and their antioxidant function to protect the eyes. The eyes require a lot of antioxidant protection. So let's talk about if you're, if you're struggling with going outside because you can't handle the bright light, and you know, you're, you're, you're avoiding sun for that reason, you might wanna consider the fact that you have some nutritional deficiencies that are contributing to your photophobia. So let's talk about some of those. This is a report published in the NDNR journal, uh, Dr. Nadia, uh, I'm gonna mangle her name, Nadia Chiua, uh, but here's what she found. Vitamin deficiencies long been Im implicated in gradual decline of vision. And in her case study that she reports on, the following case study describes a correlation between sudden temporary loss of vision, blurry vision, chronic photophobia, again, sensitivity to that bright light, and severe vitamin D deficiency. And in this particular case, correcting this patient's vitamin D led to a recovery and an absence of photophobic symptoms. Now that's not, the, um, that's not the only nutrient that we know that can create or contribute to photophobia. And as you can see in this particular study published in Annals of Medicine and Surgery on vitamin B12. Now vitamin B12 doesn't typically manifest with visual symptoms. It's more common that vitamin B12 deficiency is gonna cause neuropathy, um, numbness, tingling of the, of the legs or, or the toes and then the hands. Vitamin B12 deficiency also oftentimes manifests as anemia or uh, specifically macrocytic anemia. But in this conclusion, you can see we suggest promptly identifying and replacing vitamin B12 in patients with optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve, with proven vitamin B12 deficiency to prevent permanent damage to the optic nerve, patients with B12 deficiency should have a baseline fundoscopic exam to rule out subclinical optic nerve damage. Moreover, patients who present with visual disturbances should be screened for vitamin B12 deficiency, especially the vegan population because of that increased risk. So again, one of the connections between vitamin B12 and neuropathy is that you absolutely need vitamin B12 to make myelin. It's part of the biochemical uh, need for myelin sheath to be able to produce the myelin sheath over the nerves. So vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to optic neuritis, which can manifest as a um, photophobic symptomatology initially. So these researchers are saying that you, know, you should have your B12 levels checked if you have visual disturbances. Now, probably the nutrient most associated or most well known for causing photophobia is vitamin B2. And this goes way back to the 1930s and 40s. So in this particular study, you can see 1942, okay, um, several researchers, so this is kind of a summary of some different research. So all these sciences, okay, so here we go. So later, Odin, Odin, and Sebrel observed a similar condition in three hospital patients who were successfully treated with riboflavin. Riboflavin is vitamin B2. The condition was called a ribonoflavinosis. And then Cruz and et al. reported the occurrence of superficial keratitis in cases showing other signs of riboflavin deficiency. Nine cases were observed in this investigation, and later the authors um, reported a further series of 47 cases of superficial keratitis. They observed that the keratitis disappeared in a few days on the administration of pure synthetic riboflavin. In the same year, Hugh, working in Shanghai, described the successful treatment of 36 cases of the same nature. So again, this goes back, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that the knowledge that riboflavin deficiency or vitamin B2 deficiency causes 
a photophobic reaction goes is probably the most well correlated and connected nutrient deficiency linked to that and um, again if you have sensitivity to bright light you might consider vitamin b2 deficiency as a cause for that and it's a very simple and inexpensive thing to do to take vitamin b2 i mean for pennies on the day you can you can take it uh, actually before we get to this one i want to pull this one up because this was published uh, by the European Food Safety Authority, uh, and this was um, published as their scientific opinion on the substantiation of health claims related to vitamin B2, in essence, riboflavin. And so one of those claims was on the maintenance of normal vision. And so you can see here, riboflavin deficiency can cause conjunctivitis with vascularization of the cornea and opacity of the lens. Um, and they go on to talk about glutathione is important in main Maintaining the normal clarity of crystallines in the lens, and glutathione reductase is a flavor protein that is particularly sensitive to riboflavin depletion. Let's, let's make that English for you. Um, so glutathione, which many of you have heard of, is one of the most powerful antioxidants in the human body. And so when glutathione is in its reduced state, it's a very powerful antioxidant, but what happens is it gets used up and then what you have is oxidized glutathione. And so it's, it's think of it like a cell phone. When you deplete the battery, the battery's dead and the cell phone won't work. Well, that's oxidized, okay? So, so what has to happen is we have to recharge the glutathione. So there's a process by which we recharge that glutathione and that protein is driven by vitamin B2 or riboflavin. So riboflavin plays a major role in helping your body to recycle glutathione so that you can continue to have solid antioxidant function. So when they're saying here glutathione and they're, call, and they're talking about how that is a, such an important uh, element to the normal clarity of crystallines in the lens, uh, and they're talking about a flavor protein that's particularly sensitive to riboflavin depletion, this is what they're talking about, this correlation between how vitamin B2 is necessary to recharge glutathione. So in finality, the panel concludes that a cause and effect relationship has been established between the dietary intake of riboflavin and maintenance of normal vision. So again, vitamin B2, probably the most common reason we would see photophobia in a person. Um, not the only reason, but probably the most common. And then we have this on, um, uh, on vitamin B3. And so you can see the vitamin B3 also known as niacin. Cutaneous, cutaneous manifestations of niacin deficiency include sunlight sensitivity. So one of the things that happens to these individuals is they can get um, highly sensitive to sunlight when they go outside. This is not the same sensitivity. This is or not that it's not photophobia, but it's sensitivity. So this would be skin redness, not not the eyes um, needing to wear sunglasses. So skin redness, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's a difference between photophobia and photosensitivity. But with niacin deficiency, we can get, again, enhanced skin burning as a result of that deficiency. So a lot of nutrient interplay between your ability to tolerate sunshine, both through the skin, you know, nutrients acting as antioxidants, nutrients acting as photoprotective mechanisms to prevent sunburning, but also nutrients behaving with the eyes to give you the ability to go out in the sun and not have to squint or feel like you need to wear sunglasses or just have a sun avoidance behavior all the way around. So all that being said, we've talked today about you know, the benefits of sunshine, both UV light as, as well as the red spectrum of sun exposure. We've talked about the disease risks associated with the lack of sunshine and how that is a much greater risk to your overall health than worrying about sunlight exposure and fear of burning to develop skin cancer. We've talked about drugs that can increase your risk for burning. Many of these drugs that are commonly prescribed are um, prescribed to treat many of the very diseases that we know lack of sunshine can contribute to in the first place. And then subsequently, we've also talked about how those same drugs can cause nutritional deficits that lead to either increased photophobia or increased sensitivity to sunlight or reducing your capacity to, to naturally protect yourself from the UV exposure to sun. And so all that being said, hopefully what you're taking away from this is that we need sun. 
And, you know, many people are going out today and they're buying all these different types of box lights, you know, the red lights and the, even the UV lights um, for home-based use. And I'm not opposed to those things, but I think you shouldn't look to those technologies in lieu of actually going outside and trying to get natural sunlight. Natural sunlight is free. It's extremely powerful. There are more benefits in natural sunlight even than to just UV lights as well as the exposure to red and near infrared light. There's a lot of light spectrum. There's yellow spectrum and blue spectrum, et cetera, that also have known benefits. And so when you go outside, you get all of those things. And I'm sure there will be more that we'll discover as time goes on, more benefits to um, how important sunshine can actually be. You know. You may live somewhere where you're saying, you know what, I just don't have the ability to be in the sun if you're in Alaska or if maybe you're in Russia or maybe you're at a very northern climate where you're, you know, your winters are long and your summers are short and your daylights are short, your daylight periods. So, you know, if you have the ability, one of the things you obviously, one of the things you can do is take a vacation, you know, go on a holiday, snowbird in winter months if you can. Um, but if you can't, this is where some of these light therapies can be very beneficial. And what I personally have, and I'm in Texas, which is, you know, in the south, but I still have these devices. I have a uh, red infrared light box. And uh, just so you guys know, nobody pays me to promote a particular brand. I'm not an affiliate for any of these different companies. That being said, I can tell you I use, the brand I have is Platinum LED. That's, I know that's gonna be the next question for many of you, is what, what brand is, is necessarily best. But this is one brand of red uh, boxes quite good. Uh, and so there's really, there's three kinds of light boxes that a person could have. You could have this type for that benefit for red and infrared. You could also have a UV lamp and to get the UV exposure. And so again, not an affiliate with this company, but they make a good light and the name of that company is called Spurdy. You can look them up online and they have a lot of different options as far as UV light boxes are concerned. And then there's also an, another kind of light box that, that many people will buy. And, and so again, these UV lamps produce UV. And so go back to all those benefits of UV light. The red produces the red and all the benefits of the red, but there's uh, there's another kind of box that are, is common, and these are called, oftentimes referred to as happy lights. And again, these are all three different types of boxes, so just trying to give you clarity. These happy lights generally have a strength of about 10,000 illuminations or 10,000 lux. Um, and, and so this is kind of emulative of what you might get if you go outside uh, in the, in the, uh, on a cloudy day, you'll have about 10,000 lux of, of light power hitting your eyes and hitting your body. These are, have, have been used for years in northern climates like Russia and Alaska to, save, to stave off seasonal affective disorder or seasonal depression um, using these boxes. And so a lot of people will use these you know, 20 minutes in the morning, sometimes be, sometime between 9 and 11 a.m. early morning exposure and the whole, you know, setting this box up about 14 inches away from your face. But these boxes are, you know, generally they're, you know, a couple of feet wide and, you know, maybe three feet tall and you just set them on a desktop and you can turn them on. They don't produce any UV, so they're not going to sunburn you. You don't have to run the risk or worry about that with one of these lights. Now, if you're using UV lamps, you know, the way I use mine in the winter months is I'll use it three to four days a week. Um, and I'm only going to be using it anywhere from two to four minutes. So it's not a very long time. I'm just using it mainly on those days in the, in the longer winter months where I can't go outside because it's either raining or there's just not any sunshine to have uh, as a result of the weather. So uh, again, this, is, this type of lamp can burn you. So you have to be careful. You don't want to just get in front of one of these uh, and turn it on for 20 minutes and fall asleep and you, know, you wake up with a, with a sunburn. And if you're on any of those medications that we talked about, certainly please talk to your doctor about whether or not you're on a medication that will really, really 
cause a strong photosensitive type of reaction to the exposure because that might be contraindicated for you in that situation. And so those of you who are in that situation, my advice is have a deeper conversation even with your doctor about what you can do to improve your health so that you no longer need that medication because avoidance of sun because you're on a drug that's treating a disease that could be naturally dealt with if you just changed your diet or changed your lifestyle to me it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you in the long run so again but all in all you need to be aware if you're on a photosensitive drug you got to be careful about the uv and then with the red light boxes i use mine and i do 20 minutes to 30 minutes a day um, and that's front and back so generally 10 to 15 minutes on the back 10 to 15 minutes in the front uh, I usually do that after I work out in the morning um, now what could you do in lieu of all three of these things is you could go outside so again I don't want I don't want you guys to think that you need to go buy a bunch of boxes and spend you know hundreds or thousands of dollars on boxes Go outside but if you're in one of those geographic locations where that's just not going to be a possibility then yes you might want to consider the use of some of these types of boxes so again go outside prioritize it put it in your schedule it's the way i work my schedule i have light time scheduled into my morning spend as much time as tolerable in the sun now everybody has different skin tones so use good judgment for you i'm not telling you know those of you with red hair and super pale skin that you need to go spend three hours in the sun every morning and um you know use good logic and use common sense here but spend as much as is tolerable in the sun as much time as you can and, and again remember the longer you go out the more tolerable you become that's part of the benefit of sunlight is you make melanin and that's the pigment that tans your skin, but it also protects you from future UV radiative damages uh, to the skin. So again, the longer, you know, the more you do it, the more tolerable you are of it. A lot, a lot of people look at sunshine the way, you know, some guys look at, at exercise, you know, you know the, the old weekend warrior uh, attribution where, they, you know, maybe the young guy was into football and then as, as time went on and he graduates from high school, goes to college, he's no longer playing sports. And then one weekend he joins a, uh, a football rec league or a football team and he plays his hardest. And it's been 15 or 20 years since he's done any training. And he, you know, basically he wrecks his knees and wrecks his hamstrings. Um, same thing happens to a lot of people with the sun is they have avoided sun for so long and then they go out on it. They just overexpose themselves on that first exposure. So again, if you haven't been out in a while, you know, Maybe try five to 10 minutes and then work your way up. You know, again, be intelligent about it. Remember that UV exposure also happens under the shade of trees. So you don't have to also, you don't have to be in the direct sun. I know a lot of you are worried about the potential for photo damage to the skin and, and, the, and the effect of the aging aspect of it. But uh, generally speaking, sunlight doesn't age your skin. Sun burning ages your skin. So, but those of you who, you know, want to be more cautious, sit under a shade tree you're still going to make uh, or you're still going to be exposed to uv and to reds and all the other spectrums of light and of course again as i said consider light boxes if you don't have the capacity to uh, if you don't live in a place where where you're going to be able to do this on a, on a regular basis so all that being said i hope you learned something new i hope you take this with you and i hope you share it with somebody that you know so, because together you know, we can, we can stop the myth that sunlight and sunlight exposure causes cancer and actually does damage. We need to be spreading the word that people need to be out and getting more sun exposure more frequently, more consistently using good judgment and common sense. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.